Hello and welcome to The Thinking Space, where we bring together experts in the same field, but from different perspectives, to lead a sort of collaborative chat about public policy problems and to try and tease out um, imaginative sort of real world solutions. So today we're going to be talking about a subject many of us talk about, but very few people know about, and that is railways. Everybody has a view on it, but I suspect most people don't really understand the way, uh, the complexity of it. So before COVID, the railway system was going through record passenger numbers, um, although it did flatline just before, but it had seen record, record passenger numbers. Obviously, the last few weeks, numbers have fallen off a cliff for obvious reasons. But there are still sort of underlying issues around the structure, despite the success story of the last few years. The costs are too high. The culture is still fairly entrenched. Um, there are still issues with overcrowding or have been up to COVID and lackluster customer service on certain lines, certain routes. So how do we solve the problems of this, this huge industry and how do we end up sort of ironing out the, um, the, the, you know, a lot of these issues? With me to discuss these important topics are three eminent guests who I think I'll get you to introduce yourselves actually. So let's start, um, I think with passengers at the heart, let's start with you, Cathy. Hi everyone, um, my name is Catherine Falker. I'm a stakeholder manager with Transport Focus and we represent transport users for rail, road, bus, tram in Great Britain. Great, John? Yes, hello everybody. Uh, John Thomas, a Director of Policy at the Rail Delivery Group. Um, and I look after what we call the reform portfolio uh, within uh, RDG. Um, so over, I guess, the past um, year or so, 18 months probably, uh, we have been uh, 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 working on industry reform uh, proposals uh, in conjunction with um, what was called the Williams Review, a review that's been undertaken on behalf of, uh, of government by, uh, by Keith Williams. Right, Richard. I'm Richard McLean. Uh, I've been uh, running trains for the whole of my working life uh, in the passenger sector. Um, I'm currently managing director of uh, a small uh, but well-established open access operator on the East Coast Main Line. Uh, where we provide passenger service to communities that had not previously been well served by rail and we were operate fully commercially uh, on the on the network uh, rather than under contract to government. Well thanks for joining us and welcome to the thinking space. So let's start with a bit of context. For most of us the experience of traveling on a train is as individual passengers. But as I mentioned, behind the scenes, there is a considerably complex organization. Britain's railway system is after all, a hugely complex network with 10,000 miles of track, two and a half thousand stations. But the railways are also about the people. There's nearly a quarter of a million people working in the rail sector and 1.7 billion passengers every year. Those passenger journeys are actually not all the same, of course. Just over half are daily commuters, are going in and out of the office, etc. But another one in three is traveling for leisure, while almost one in 10 is traveling for business. And of course, there's freight on top of that. So really, we need to look at these very different groups of users and work out what they all individually need from their rail companies. So it's a massive piece of national infrastructure, a big employer, and important for the national economy and our quality of lives. But as an industry, even before COVID, it's fair to say that the industry was in an organizational mess. It was nationalized for 50 years, then privatized, and more recently, semi-nationalized again. And with two regulators, with the Department of Transport, as we're gonna hear later, taking more and more of a day-to-day -day control than people probably realize. So, John, let me start with you. First of all, I hope you agree that that was a fair summing up, but where would you say we are now? It, it is. So, uh, just, to, um, just to touch on the point you made about record, um, record passenger numbers, um, it's sometimes said that, um, well, it's, that, that's all been driven by, by economic growth, by, by employment growth. And in actual fact, um, since privatisation, passenger numbers um, have grown at double the rate um, of, of GDP. So I'd certainly argue that uh, the train operators uh, have played a quite significant role um, through marketing, pricing measures and, and other measures in terms of encouraging people to, uh, 
to, to use rail. And, and I think that's been a massive success of the public and, and private partnership of, of the railway. Um, it's transformed the finances um, of the railway. So I wonder the latter years of, of BR, um, there was an operating subsidy of about £2 billion um, pounds, uh, a, a year. Um, that um, has fallen to about 500 million um, pre-COVID. Um, so much more of the money that's been in, in put into the railway by government and taxpayers um, is going into capital, uh, much needed capital um, investment, um, whether that be renewals um, or enhancement project, uh, projects. Um, but clearly that's, um, it, it, we've almost been a victim of our own success. Um, the more people that come onto the railway, um, capacity of the railway hasn't expanded significantly and yet we're putting more and more and more trains onto that limited uh, capacity. Um, that's led to, um, to, to performance problems. Um, we've had issues, of course, with, the, uh, with franchising, um, with um, well-documented uh, failures of uh, Virgin Trains East Coast with, uh, with Northern. And of course, it's not the first time that the East Coast franchise um, has, has failed as well. So even, um, even before Williams uh, uh, kicked off the, the Williams Review, uh, we were advocating for reform. Uh, we said that um, contractual reform was absolutely um, uh, necessary, but things like reform of the fare system as well, which essentially we've still got fares regulations which um, uh, date back to, to the British Rail um, days, uh, and we've had layer and layer and layer of, of regulation since then, but no sort of fundamental review, and we just don't think that uh, the fare system now is delivering for, uh, for, for passengers. Um, if, you ha if you have a look at some of the catastrophes that we've perpetuated, or inflicted on passengers over the last three years. Um, you know, it, it was the it was the specification led railway that delivered the May eighteen timetable. That was people. I was only following orders. Uh, Which was approach. an unmitigated disaster. Yeah, and it's now over two years since that happened, and we're still stuck in the doom loop that we implemented then. I think an interesting point as well is, you know, we're, we're surveying people. What are you going to do? How are you going to travel in the future? And I think a lot of what we think we're going to do in the future, it isn't necessarily what we are going to do in the future because no one knows what the future is going to look like. So some, so, so in some ways, it's a very open book in that way as well, isn't it? I think um, it was interesting, Adrian, that you made a distinction between the pre-COVID world and, and um, where we are today. Um, and certainly the railways were able to demonstrate their crucial role in uh, providing connectivity for communities uh, and for passengers um, as part of uh, a, a, a machine that drives the economy of the country. Uh, I mean, clearly the COVID situation has changed people's ability to travel and to do business and to enjoy uh, the pleasures of life in, in the way they did before. But I think it's very revealing uh, as to the crucial role that rail transport performs, that the government has chosen to step in so quickly and to such an extent to maintain and sustain the capacity and capability of the rail network. We've seen across uh, Europe where, of course, the you know, the, the COVID hit earlier and then recovery is coming earlier, that it's the av availability of transport links and particularly rail transport links uh, that are sitting at the centre of uh, regenerating and re reigniting the local economies. And I think in that context, it, it's really important to distinguish between what the railways do for the people they serve and the communities they serve and then the structures that politicians and the rail industry build uh, in order to sustain that, that service. And so often it's the failure in the structural elements, the things that we do as an industry and the things that governments do uh, as a key funder uh, that are getting in the way of what the railway is capable of doing to serve communities and to serve passengers. Cathy, I think you had your hand up, and that's a very appropriate juncture, actually, because passengers actually should be at the heart of all of this. 
Well, I was going to touch on a couple of points. I mean, obviously, this pandemic is horrible. It's had a devastating effect on many people's lives. But it's also, as we emerge from it, perhaps a great opportunity for change in the railway. Um, if we look, we do a research every two or three years on passengers' priorities for improvement in rail. And they're always the same. Value for money, passengers able to get a seat, more trains arrive on time than they do now, less frequent unplanned disruptions. Well, unplanned disruption is something that will happen from time to time. But if we look at the others, perhaps as we emerge from this pandemic, before, while we're still living with the virus, everyone is being encouraged to um, be more flexible with their work patterns, to work from home as much as possible. So perhaps that will also see, um, as, as people return to the railway, a, a, will move away from everyone traveling at the same time of the day. And perhaps the same, ideally, you may even return to almost pre-pandemic volumes of passengers, but not everybody wanting to get into central London for 9 a.m. So it managed to be staggered, which would also be a way for the railway to deliver more on the passengers' priorities for improvement, because with how we were before the pandemic, that was gonna be quite hard to do, getting a seat, more trains arriving on time. When you're running the network at such high capacity, then it, it's one small delay in one place and it has a knock-on effect for the rest of the day with uh, trains coming in and out of, for example, Waterloo. So, and also value for money. Perhaps we will now see flexible season tickets and perhaps a change away from the current pricing structure to allow people to be more flexible about um, when they commute. That, that's a really interesting point. And, and the, the whole demographics, I think COVID-19 has shown that the whole demographics of who travels when they travel is going to change. And in a sort of slightly perverse way, COVID-19 has done the railway a bit of a favour. Because uh, as you've identified, there were always problems at the peak because that's when you have max capacity. Um, and, you know, there was no spare capacity and that's when everybody wants to travel. So if with home working, people doing what we're doing right now, talking on Zoom, uh, results in people travelling less on the 812 from Surbiton to Waterloo back on the 1743, um, and, and travelling off peak or maybe home working three or four days a week mm -hmm. or even travelling longer distance, um, it might be that Richard's customers in the future his passengers are going to be part-time workers who, sorry, part of people who work from home, part-time commuters who might move further afield and might move up to Thirsk in North Yorkshire and, and commute from Thirsk to London one day a week, as opposed to daily commute from, from a suburb. I, I was reading a, an opinion piece in a local Hartlepool newspaper this morning that was making exactly that point, that the service that we provide from Hartlepool is uh, supporting the local economy. Uh, weekly commuting is uh, a, a trend that's developed. Uh, wealth coming back into the community that was otherwise cut off from the opportunities that connectivity delivered. Um, I think that there'll undoubtedly be changes in travel patterns and, and passenger demand uh, as we revert to a new normal. Um, I suspect people will do less of the things they didn't enjoy before all of this, and they've been forced to stop doing recently. So commuting, um, going to big offices and sitting, looking at each other, uh, uh, wearing ties. Um, but I think people will also want to do more of the things that they've missed doing. So traveling to uh, entertain themselves, to meet friends, uh, will will become uh, dominant now what what where you've got a changing environment what experience has told me over my career is that the service providers are best placed to respond to that change if they're able to make local meaningful informed decisions an industry or our industry performs particularly badly where that decision-making is sucked away to a distant center, uh, influenced by other factors, the passenger message diluted along the way. I absolutely agree with, uh, with what Richard said there. And, and I think um, we, you know, as we come out of the, the crisis and, and travel patterns will change, 
we need to be as agile as we possibly can be as an industry to respond to those uh, changing demands from from customers and, and clearly you know the old um, franchise contract with very detailed specific obligations which are very difficult to change over the course of the franchise period um, to my mind are just not appropriate in in that in that new world we need to be able to respond quickly i think bears reform is, is again i'll come back to that it's a good example that um, if we want to attract customers back have uh, uh, fares reform and uh, taking the flexible season tickets uh, as, as an example, um, I think there was a concern previously that um, that would uh, result in a reduction in, in revenue um, because you're uh, providing a more flexible, potentially cheaper product for those that are only traveling one, two, three days a week rather than forcing them to buy um, uh, uh, a much more expensive weekly, um, monthly or annual um, ticket. We're, in, we're just in a completely different world now. If you don't offer customers that um, greater flexibility with flexible seasons, they won't come back at all. Yeah. So, so uh, it, it's a revenue generator post-COVID in, in my mind, as opposed to a reduction in revenue. Which actually brings us back to the most important person of all of this is the passenger. Um, so I mean, Kathy, you know, Kathy's the one who, who has to uh, re represent passengers who, frankly, it must be so confused by all this endless interfering and all this endless structural change, when ultimately, if it was any other business, the business is run completely around what the customer wants. So, Kathy, what, what are people telling you, apart from the, you know, the, the, the standard sort of uh, comments about performance and fares and getting a seat and things, but digging down, what do you sense is the, is the sort of um, uh, the concerns when it comes to structure? I think, as you said, most people don't really get it. Many people don't know the difference between network rail and the train operator, and many people don't even necessarily notice we know from our NRPS surveys when they respond, which service they were on. Not always, because in some ways, why would you? You buy your ticket, you go where you need to go. But one thing I think about the current situation we find ourselves in is everybody is listening carefully and waiting for instruction, passengers as well. How to travel, what do I do, you know, and as well, you have businesses, it's also in their interest to try and be more flexible with their workforce. Um, so, I think a lot of the things that passengers would like to see from railway, which a lot of them come down to the things that we I mentioned before, which is capacity, being able to get a seat, better value for money, may well flow naturally out of the situation we find ourselves in. But I think one of the key things for people at the moment is reassurance. Reassurance that it's safe to travel. Um, reassurance um, and I actually think the, ma the mandatory wearing of face masks is one step towards providing some of that reassurance but at the moment everybody whether they're transport providers or businesses are focusing on the same thing how to manage this pan the virus and how to try to return to some semblance of normality so everyone is focused on the same thing so that is actually it is a very good time to make change um, and also the railway is not faced with the old uh, challenge of having everyone wanting to travel at the same time, pretty much. That would have been impossible to move away from previously. So that is also a possibility. Um, it, it makes it easier to make change. But I think at the moment, people are very much waiting to see what's going to happen. But I think as shops have opened now, non-essential shops, it is a little bit woolly perhaps about whether you can take public transport to go to a non-essential shop and you know that, that that's just the way things are so at the moment every as a railway industry you have everyone's attention i think there's a you make some a really strong point there everybody is waiting for somebody to tell everybody else what to do yeah um uh, and can you use public transport to travel to non-essential shops can you use public transport to travel to non-essential beaches yeah. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that Amber Solaire is a uh, viricide, but it seemed to be the only precaution that was being taken. Um, and and this, is, this is a rail industry disease in itself. Everybody waiting for somebody to say which way we should go and what we should do. And there was a lovely exchange at the Transport Select Committee after the uh, May 2018 timetable debacle 
where the chair of the Transport Select Committee uh, was asking who was responsible, who was in charge of this activity. And the rail industry effectively came back and said, well, nobody really. Um, we're all in this together. It's a sort of, you know, loose affiliation of like my. If you look at other customer service uh, providers in the transport sector, for people who are effectively our competitors, the individual companies, they collaborate, but they take action and they lead and they communicate and they give really strong messages to their customers about the precautions they're taking, about why passengers should feel safe and secure traveling with them. And as a result, they are now progressively opening up ridership this is what's happening across Europe. It's happening in Germany and France and Spain, and it's being successful. And they are increasing the market share of public transport uh, rather than what we're doing, driving people back into cars. The prime minister was able to stand up and say that people should feel confident going back to, to shopping. We should also have been able to say at that time, and you should feel confident to travel on public transport. You can choose who wants to pick up on that. Cathy, <laughs> uh, maybe from a, from a passenger perspective, do you think that would work? Oh yes, I think it would work. I think um, at the moment people don't understand, as we were saying, all the constraints that the railway companies are operating under. And I think that also with the, one of the effects of this pandemic, we were talking about um, changes in working patterns, but we may well also see changes in leisure travel patterns because people will perhaps no we will no longer all be so constrained from this sort of nine to five. So it might be that people have their leisure times at different times. And I think some of the things that some people are perhaps a bit reluctant to adopt that do help the railway operate more smoothly, like contactless tickets. Um, and we're being moved away from cash now. I mean, the cash point uh, at the DLR station here in Shadwell told me when I went to take some money for the fruit market that the money had been sterilised. Well, only until I've touched it, right? Um, people, I mean by that is people are now avoiding cash. It's, it's a way to, uh, to spread disease. So perhaps another thing is that when we emerge at the other end is people will have adopted some of the um, habits that would make it easier to... Um, run a more efficient railway, mobile ticketing. And also I think people are now more used to looking on train websites for information about traveling, something people didn't always perhaps do. And so perhaps there's more of an engagement there in a way between the passenger and the operator in terms of the passenger listening to the operator to see what they're supposed to do and what's happening. Um, I think that choice, as you were saying, is, is, is a key element here. And we've done some research for the DFT in the past about why people don't use railway, right? Why don't they use railway? And a lot of the time, it's just perception. It's a perception that the car is cheaper and it's a perception the car's more convenient. But often when people work out the cost of the train ticket against the car, they only look at how much petrol costs. They forget the MOT, the insurance, the cost of the vehicle in the first place and things like that. But it might be that, sorry, as, as we emerge, some of these perceptions can be addressed. Yes, so we know the commuter peak is enormous. There's actually five times as many people traveling between eight and nine in the morning as at any other time after 10 o'clock. So it's in everybody's interest to flatten that peak, isn't it? So I wonder if COVID could actually be giving the government an opportunity to really push things like flexible hours, more working from home, more part-time commuting, because commuters, after all, and their bosses um, appear far more open now to do things differently. I think so, yes, because it, it, while we were saying it's very much driven by committed obligations and franchise contracts, those have all been suspended and were under serious review anyway as to whether that was still appropriate um, and, and the best way to run things. And uh, so it might be more demand-led, the response. For example, the CEO of Barclays a while ago, um, there was an article on the BBC News, he was saying that when, and well, assuming we do return to normal life, 
he does not intend to fill his Canary Wharf office with all 7,000 staff again, because he's realized that with remote working, it's not necessary. You'll get more out of your staff if they're allowed to be more flexible. Um, so in some ways, it might actually be uh, that the reforms and the changes that we will see may actually inadvertently, or just because of the way the pandemic has um, rolled out, played out, be led by the demand by what people, how people choose to use the railway in the future, this flexible working. And I think the working from home will have gone on for long enough that it will affect permanent change. I think with anything, if you only, if we'd all worked from home for just a month, we might have all spoken about it, but quite chances are if we then all been told we could go back to normal after a month of lockdown, I expect many of those changes just wouldn't have happened. But I think it would have gone on for long enough for people to be able to appreciate it. And I don't, I think this check, we were already changing, weren't we, slightly from the traditional nine to five, that was already seen. But we've just kind of ripped it up completely now and are starting again. So I think that to some extent, what happens next with the railway will perhaps be steered by what people want, what tickets are. And, and I think my, my biggest fear is that the opportunity that's locked inside this crisis will be missed, that we will paralyze ourselves with endless analysis mm -hmm. and uh, tend to revert back to previous thinking as tends to be the case when you centralize all decision making. Mm -hmm. um, we instead, on the intercity sector, we've got to reignite demand. We've got to make it relevant for passengers to travel again in, these, in, the, changed, in, in, in the changed world. And I think going? also, sorry, Go ahead. sorry, I was gonna say, I, I think um, also that there's the fact that um, many people will need to be encouraged back to railway. People have been pushed into their cars now. <laughs> and so it'll have to almost be an even more attractive offer to, to get people, especially while we're living with the virus. A lot of this that we're discussing will depend a little bit on whether there's a vaccine. But while we're living with the virus, it will have to be quite an attractive offer to get people to come back and leave their cars at home, which is, would be a good thing for many reasons, actually. But then perhaps that could be easier with less crowded trains and that people traveling in, in more, at more varied times, that traveling into work by the train will be more attractive than it was. Yes, I mean, clearly getting passengers back onto trains post-COVID is going to be a um, big and important challenge for the industry. But of course, this is also about money, isn't it? So let's talk about finances. Um, I mean, it costs around £18 billion pounds a year to run the rail network. £18 billion, that's a huge sum. Uh, that obviously covers running costs and capital investment. £10 billion of that comes from passengers from the fare box. A billion is invested from the train operating companies, known as TOX. Um, but that still leaves around £7 billion pounds a year coming from central funds from us, the taxpayer. That's about right, isn't it, John? Yeah, absolutely. I think the deficit is probably about 16 billion at the moment, uh, Adrian. Well, I, I wasn't factoring in COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Given that we've got very little revenue coming into the uh, into the railway. But absolutely, it's an important point. And I think, again, post-COVID, post, post -COVID, government funding is going to be even more constrained. Um, and there's going to be more pressure on us as an industry, collectively, as a system, to become much more um, uh, efficient. Um, but again, the, the, there's the, 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 the number of elements to that. One is in terms of what can TOPS do to uh, become more pro productive, more efficient um, in relation to their own costs, when, again, partly through the way that um, they're contracted, about 80% of their costs are fixed. Um, so what is it that we would need to put in place in order to enable um, TOPS to become more productive and, and more cost efficient, but also what can be done jointly with Network Rail, as you say, Network Rail I think it is a £10 billion pound a year uh, business. What can we do collectively as an industry um, to, to, to help network rail um, become much more, more cost efficient? Because the, the, the possible alternative is we're going to get less investment um, uh, in the future as, uh, as government funding becomes more constrained. 
I mean, a lot of the problem is that the Tox actually are not masters of their own destiny. They are so constrained by the stipulations from the, of the contracts from the DFT that it's very, very difficult for them to actually show that sort of entrepreneurial spirit that could either drive up revenues or drive down costs. So actually, I want to turn to Richard here because Richard has been in both worlds, both the, the Tox world when he was at GNER, um, which was a franchised operator, and then more recent as MD of Grand Central, which is an open access operator, which for the benefit of people who don't know what that is, um, there are a few small open access operators who are truly independent, free of government, and they stand on their own two feet. If they make money, that's all well and good. If they don't, they don't. Um, and they have to demonstrate that they are effectively delivering new value by coming up with new routes and they're not just directly abstracting revenue from the franchisee. So, Richard, in terms of uh, becoming more fleet of foot, more agile, coming up with a system that is uh, likely to develop uh, more like a proper business, if you like, where, where passengers book first rather than DFT pen pushers, um, what would you see as the biggest barrier in terms of that sort of innovation? I think uh, I, I've had the, the privilege of working, as you say, with an open access operator now and with a franchised operator in the past. But actually, the difference between what a franchised operator was at the time I was at GNER and what Grand Central is able to do today is not that great. At the beginning of the franchise process, particularly in the intercity sector, the operators were much more uh, enabled to make local passenger focused decisions about how they develop their service patterns, how they organize their uh, customer service offer, how they organize their staff. They were taking more risk in those areas because it was about driving growth uh, through innovation uh, and uh, increasing customer satisfaction. I think the biggest challenge that um, my heirs and successors in, in that world have had is that they've been micromanaged and micro-specified into delivering centrally uh, created uh, visions of, of what's appropriate. And it's very difficult to fully understand what objectives those specifications are trying to address. I think it's also notable that um, many of the challenges that John was highlighting uh, that we've struggled with as an industry of late, timetable changes that haven't worked, under-resourced um, uh, new operations, um, ticket uh, price levels, ticket ticketing structures, are all intrinsically linked to the specifications and the, the mission that those franchised operators have been set out to undertake. It's less about their execution um, and more about whether the plan uh, was appropriate and valid. So the biggest challenge I see in us building the new future is how to m create, foster, uh, and enable that local decision-making, local passenger focus, uh, so that the appropriate actions and changes can be uh, undertaken at the right time in the right places. Um, to empower operators to manage network rail as a supplier, uh, to manage their, uh, the costs and the disruption they import onto the network, rather than simply sit as a go-between between, between two government departments. Um, so creating a world where train operators can behave much more like customer service businesses in any other sector and not be bound into the artificial structures that uh, for some reason we feel are necessary uh, in the rail sector uh, seems to be the key, the key enabler and the key barrier. That's really interesting. I think I'm going to turn to John just one second, because I'd just like to pick up on a, a point that both of you have made is that the, we are now in a space post, well, hopefully towards the end of COVID-19, we are in it, the railway is in an absolutely unique position to do things differently and to show that sort of entrepreneurial spirit that's been sorely lacking, um, to show that sort of individual dynamism and, and innovation that's been lacking. What I have sensed, and I'm declaring interest, interest here because I work as a consultant for uh, um, uh, a heritage charter 
operator that runs very much top end charters. And I saw an opportunity as a non-exec director of, uh, of a development company on the Settlement to Carlisle line um, for running uh, non-essential um, tourist trains, realizing that this, that this summer there would be a real problem for Northern, the, the franchisee, in that they would have too many people and not enough space. Now that would have been unheard of because under the not primary abstractive uh, rules running a competing service on the same line effectively using the same service pattern would have been classed as abstractive. However and largely thanks to John here uh, from the RDG and from very progressive people in Northern um, and in Network Rail as well. We've managed in eight weeks to go from uh, what might have seemed like a fairly daft idea to something that's been greenlit and is now going to start. And that is just a sort of microcosm of what can be done with a bit of a can-do attitude. Um, so, I mean, John, you know, given that so many people have always accused rail of being a bit of a basket case, do you see light now at the end of the tunnel in terms of you know, some creative thinking? Um, I mean, it's a good example you give, Adrian, but, but they're, they're few and far between. Um, there, should be, there should be much more of that. But unfortunately, given the framework that we've got, it doesn't encourage that, that sort of innovation. Um, you know, go back to the, the, the franchise contracts that we now have, basically a very input driven, you have to deliver all of these under the committed obligations. It doesn't encourage that creative thinking and, and, and in, innovation. And what we're saying is, uh, certainly for long distance routes, um, I mean, my, my own personal preference is that you, you would have competition on, on long distance routes. Um, but um, it, it, I, I, if we haven't got that, the second best for me is to have, go back to what Richard was talking about earlier, that we had at the start, more outcome-based um, contracts. So you know, you've got to make your customers happy. I don't care how you do that, but you've got to make them happy. Um, and uh, you, you go away and deliver it. That's the way to, to create an environment for more innovation and a much more customer-focused um, at railway. Because in that environment, when your passengers' expectations and needs and requirements change, you have to change. You've got to deliver what your customers want not deliver what your contract says you have to deliver. And I think many people would be absolutely staggered that the rail industry is so unfleet of foot and so operationally led rather than demand led or customer led. And it's all this one size fits all. I mean, Kathy, from a passenger perspective, this must be incredibly frustrating to find that, you know, what could be so much better and cheaper and more agile and more efficient is actually being um, stymied by by a, a clunky clunky framework. Well, it is, and I think the other problem is that often people don't know anything about the framework behind it. They just see it as incompetence by the operator that they can't put more carriages on the end of their trains and you know various other things, and don't understand the franchise system. I mean, well, you wouldn't really, would you, unless you had a particular interest in the railway. And also, of course, these franchise bids are written before, way before the franchise is actually won. So it's very difficult to be so specific about what your committed obligation should be, what your passengers need, what your business needs are. And once the franchise is signed, from my understanding, it's quite hard to get it changed. It's quite hard to go back to the department and say, oh, we've realized that this committed obligation is no longer actually quite the right thing. Very, very hard to do. So. I don't know if any other businesses operate like that, where you would set your kind of strategic objectives and your KPIs nine years in advance, for argument's sake, and then stick to them rigidly without any possibility of change. Um, I, mean, I think if you explain it like that to most people, it sounds a bit nuts, doesn't it? Well, and there, therein lies the problem. But I mean, Richard, you, you are the closest, I suppose, that, to we, that, that we have to a, to a business that can be fleet of foot and customer-led, yeah. because, of course, you are free of of government interference. Obviously you're regulated in terms of safety, but, um, but in terms of your commercial um, product, you are pretty free to do what you like. And, and I think that's worked quite well for you, hasn't it? And resulted in more competition actually on the line, not just for you, but the franchise operator too, yeah. more traffic to rail. No, uh, uh, absolutely. And um, because of the structure of, of the, um, the industry, um, our first task, is to find markets and to find communities that have been underserved and then use innovation to find a way of providing the service that they're they're looking for in a way that's commercially viable these are places that the franchised operators and the 
the 10 year old strategy that's in the specification has actively chosen to not serve, to neglect and to isolate from uh, the, the key connectivity that they need. So we get in there, we understand what's required, and then we find a way of delivering. And uh, you can change, uh, but you, we pick up exactly the same messages about what is important, value for money, punctuality, a seat, some friendly faces in, in the customer service environment. But there's, there's a double benefit to having that flexibility and to have a business that is always striving to improve and to go a step further in customer service. It attracts great people who want to be part of a place where they can make a difference as an individual rather than be stuck into a compliance based uh, environment where they're measured by their ability to match up against um, the old plan that they inherited from somebody else many, many years before. Um, so it's a lot more fun. Um, it's a lot more rewarding for the people um, and it, it works. And the key thing that makes it work, so I, I know we use the term competition, but actually what we're providing is choice. Choice for employees, choice for passengers. Um, and the network is big enough to have that choice provided. Um, we look at how much growth there's been on, particularly the intercity sector that John highlights. Um, there is space to have multiple operators in this country on the key routes, as they do in Italy and in France and in Spain and in Germany and in Austria, the Czech Republic, Poland, <laughs> Sweden, it's just us, really, that's sticking with monopoly provision of key customer so service. And just, just to clarify on that point, you are talking, obviously, about intercity long distance routes yes. rather than commuter routes. We're clearly having... Uh, uh, absolutely. So commuter routes, people, people's needs are, are much, much more straightforward. They're, you know, it's I need very to be able well. to go to the station, get on a train and go. I don't want to plan, I don't want to think about fares. I, I the, you know, have everything smart in the background. Intercity is about choice. And at the moment, the market, deficit yeah. that's missing in our country is choice for the passenger. This, this is a really interesting point because of course the railway is not all things to all people. The, the needs of intercity passengers, predominantly business and leisure, very different from commuters, very different from rural. Um, so we need a mixed model really, don't we? rather than having a one-size-fits-all. Uh, absolutely, and I think that's what Richard was, uh, was saying. Um, you know, customers of, of railway services are, are not homogenous. You know, they, they, they travel for different purposes. They have different needs, different requirements. Um, so I, as a commuter, as Richard said, I want frequency. You know, I, I, I want four or six trains an hour um, into, uh, into London. Um, I, I don't want choice between operators. I want frequency. I want a, I want a simple fare system or a flexible uh, fare system. Um, if I'm traveling a uh, lot longer distance, um, I, I, I appreciate having the choice on, uh, on, on, on some uh, routes. Um, uh, I, I have family in, in, in Doncaster. Um, I can make a choice or my, my family can make a choice when they come down to see me as to which operator they use. Um, Including his. And, and, and I think, you know, customers, and I think um, uh, Transport Focus surveys have shown this, on those long, long distance routes, customers do value choice. Um, and therefore, what we don't want is that one size fits all approach to future contracts when we're, we're in the sort of the post COVID, post, post Williams uh, world. Um, you know, we've heard it say that so actually the TFL concession model works really well. So actually, let's just have the TFL concession model everywhere on the network. Well, that, no, that's not the answer. The answer is, yes, the TFL type concession model work really well in commuter markets. So absolutely, let's see where else in, in the country, other commuter markets, city regions, where that type of contract is absolutely appropriate, but on long distance routes, much more sort of commercial and commercially driven. Let's look at completely different types of, of contracts, out, outcome-based uh, contracts, or even better, again, in, in, in my view, um, more competition, more operators and more choice. 
Yes, that's clear, isn't it? I mean, the idea that one sort of franchise or contract would fit different passenger markets is obviously wrong. But John, let's talk about another subject, which I'm sure will seem odd to those unfamiliar with the inner workings of the railways. And that is the fact that there are actually two regulators. So how much of a barrier is this fact to useful change? Yeah, so again, we, we've advocated that um, the, uh, a large part of ORR's economic regulation functions and the DFT's franchising functions are brought together in a new independent um, rail body. It needs to be done jointly because the railway is a system. So having one regulator that determines things for one part of that system and another body that determines uh, what the other part of that system need, needs to do um, just doesn't work. Um, so if you, if you have a body that is responsible for both sides, both legs, the infrastructure leg and the operations leg, that you can join up um, at the top and that you haven't then got an artificial allocation of money potentially, you know, every five years between infrastructure and operations that actually there's much more flexibility to move money around in the, in, in the system. Um, that to me is, uh, is the answer. Um, I mean, Net Network Rail actually, um, I would argue, um, is how it certainly was regulated on, a, on an, out, an outcome based basis. You know, the regulator doesn't tell Network Rail how many of track, how, how many miles of track to, uh, to, to renew. Um, so actually, there is a, a model um, there already in terms of outcome based regulation that the new independent rail body could take on board for the sector as a whole and the system as a whole. So that, obviously that's that's one of the key solutions. I mean, Richard, in terms of, you know, what, what else do we need to do? We've reformed the regulation. What's the second step? Well, I think you know, John is absolutely right to highlight that the, the rail network is a system. It, it's a, we have a mixed traffic railway. We do all sorts of things with the same tracks uh, and signals. We have uh, freight as well in the mix here. And so we need strong systems thinking in joining that all together at an operational level. But I, I have, I'm aware of no successful model of where command and control delivers world-class customer service. I don't think anybody has pulled that trick off anywhere else ever before. We, so we need to match the systemization and the strong leadership of the system uh, uh, delivery with a localization uh, and a passenger focused led um, approach uh, in the in the delivery of the actual uh, service on board trains uh, in its design uh, and in and its pricing and its retailing and all of those aspects that directly impact on the passenger let, you know let let us railway geeks go and take away all that gubbin stuff that sits behind the customer experience the passenger experience and but really localize and promote success through outcomes in the customer in interface of course there's a danger though that with the uh, government's keenness maybe rather naive keenness to assume that a concession model across the board is the answer um, which certainly answers some of the some of the concerns over fragmentation but doesn't actually address these very key points that uh, that, that that you've all talked about i i i remain extraordinarily puzzled why a professional politician would want to place their personal career on the line on the basis of what sandwiches are being sold on the 930 from Doncaster. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> and we have seen as ministers get themselves embroiled in too much of that detail that they're incapable of addressing the, the problems that arise and it damages them as individuals. They've got a, an incredibly important role to perform in driving the national economic impact, ensuring that uh, things are done in a safe and organized way, but choose the place to apply your, your energies where you can make a positive difference rather than getting uh, distracted by things that, uh, frankly, other people should be looking after for you. 
uh, the irony is that ministers never took responsibility for these issues when the railway was nationalized. They made absolutely certain that they had a chair of the British Railways Board who was accountable for the outcomes of the rail industry. The ministers enabled, the industry delivered. And we need to get back to that type of framework where the national imperatives are set nationally and then they're delivered locally with a strong systems envelope around it to make sure it all joins together. That's really interesting. So, John, I mean, we've talked a lot about reform. I mean, one of them, I think that's absolutely key is, is, is that there's one central voice, which is something you've advocated, which makes a lot of sense. Um, fares reform is obviously part of that. Um, different models, mixed models, you know, the, the, the needs of uh, Richard's passengers are very different from a lot of the commuters who will um, badger Cathy when they've had a, a rotten commute, which again are very different from my passengers on my, my dedicated tourist charter train that's going to be running this summer. So, you know, it is extraordinary that the railway business is, has always been operated on a one size fits all. And ultimately, that's actually what privatisation was supposed to be about. Uh, and that was the criticism of BR, that it couldn't be all things to all people. Um, from your point of view, from the umbrella organisation, from the RDG, what can you do to ensure that that message gets through? Um, so we're absolutely um, giving that message to, uh, to government. We've worked uh, closely with the uh, Williams um, team as they've been developing um, their proposals. Um, we're very keen whenever government announces the, the, the reforms that are going to take place and um, I saw the Secretary of State in front of the Transport Select Committee yesterday um, is now saying by the end of the year, um, so we may not see um, anything in, in the autumn, um, which, um, which may make sense given that um, um, at the end of, uh, towards the end of September, what government have put in place in terms of the emergency measures agreements um, end and we need something that um, takes us through the transition period um, before uh, reforms can be fully um, implemented. The Secretary of State did talk about an opportunity for those reforms to be accelerated, that, that COVID has perhaps uh, provided um, that opportunity. Um, and we're very keen that once um, the overall uh, proposals are, are announced, that, um, that the industry collectively can have a strong voice in terms of um, how those reforms should be implemented. If you just take one example, the, we're advocating a new national rail body, its effectiveness will be critically dependent on how it operates. So it's, and it must be a customer focused, customer led um, organisation um, where, um, but not an engineering led organisation where infrastructure and, and operations um, sit, uh, sit side by side. Richard mentioned earlier that you know, network rail acting as a key supplier to, um, to train operators in order that they can then deliver for, for customers. So how the reforms are implemented are actually just as important, if not more important, than the sort of high level reforms themselves. Cathy, from a passenger perspective, is this all welcome news from what you're hearing? Oh yes, it is. I mean, um, putting the passenger first also makes business sense, doesn't it? As we've said earlier, that is how most commercial enterprises operate, looking at what your customer needs and then delivering it. And um, so that would certainly be, uh, yeah, welcome to passengers, for sure. And I also think one other point is that traditionally the commuters were a captive audience for railway, weren't they? And I think one thing this pandemic might have changed is they won't be quite as captive as they were. So it'll be important to make, as uh, we were saying previously earlier, um, the railway uh, attractive as an attractive mode of transport for them. Richard, I mean, from, from your point of view, has open access, you think it's never been terribly popular with the DFT. Do you think that COVID-19, the new world we're in, the need for a mixed model um, is going to, you know, win, win you more friends? I think it was Samuel Pepys that said uh, a monopoly is a terrible thing until you get given one of your own. Um, but they've never worked for customers and they've never worked for the economy. So uh, securing the system through uh, a, a single industry guiding mind, uh, rationalizing 
uh, the inherited and piecemeal fare system so that we can have local operators making local decisions to deliver outcomes for passengers and communities across the country is absolutely essential. This industry has never been more relevant to the UK economy, but it's also never had a situation where it's had to justify what it does quite as much. If we don't up our game, if we don't take the opportunity that this crisis presents us with, uh, we will fail and we will become irrelevant. So stepping up to the plate, really providing passengers with choice in the areas that it matters to them so that we are relevant and we can deliver and then we will thrive. That's fascinating. I mean, what we've heard is some really strong, compelling evidence that this is a unique opportunity, a truly unique opportunity, actually, to do things differently. It's what passengers have been crying out for, what the industry has been crying out for, and actually what UK PLC is crying out for. Uh, rail supports jobs, it supports um, uh, um, growth, and this is the kind of reform that we need. So COVID-19, it's an opportunity to turn a bad situation to something good with a new solid strength, strengthened regulator, um, cutting back in bureaucracy, allowing a mixed model, and effectively having a new entrepreneurial can-do attitude, which I'm, I'm convinced actually can work. And if anything, you know, as, as proved the point, it's the fact that I've, you know, seen how things can, can work in a short space of time with, with the opening up of this new dedicated timetable tourist operation in the last eight weeks, which I have to say eight weeks ago, I was very skeptical that it would happen, but it has. So thanks very much to all of you, to Richard, Kathy, and John. It's been fascinating um, chatting. Thanks very much for joining the Thinking Space. And um, please, to those of you watching, please uh, continue to watch us, tweet us, hashtag us, Facebook us. Um, continue to watch on social media and share everything we do. And um, let's, uh, you know, take this forward to the next level. Thanks very much to everybody. And um, thanks again to all my guests. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.